Well, first of all, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this important event. As you know, the United Kingdom has led on the important issue of conflict-related sexual violence for over a decade, and I myself have had the huge and humbling honor to, amongst my ministerial responsibilities, to also be the UK Prime Minister's Special Representative on Preventing Sexual Violence in Conflict. And today's debate, again, illustrates the collaborative commitment on really standing up to this scourge, this scourge of conflict-related sexual violence, which continues, regrettably and tragically, around the world. But I'm particularly delighted that we're joined by both uh, uh, Na Sayasaya and Nadine, and Noah and Nadine will, I'm sure, speak in a moment and share their reflections from their own perspectives. But I'm really grateful to both of them for their valuable insights they provided to the Security Council. But when we cast an eye around the world, whether we're looking at the DRC, where I visited in November, Ukraine, Myanmar, Sudan, and indeed many other places of the world, we continue to see the use of conflict-related sexual violence as a real weaponization of war. It's wrought upon many survivors of conflict, survivors who hope that they've survived the worst of their ordeals and then are violated in a most abhorrent way. And I think we really need to focus in on that. I sought in my remarks once again, as I always do, that it's not something that matters to Tariq Ahmed as a minister of the United Kingdom. It should matter to us in whatever we do and to the journalists present here in the reporting you do. It matters to us as human beings. Um, for example, in Sudan, we've seen increasing reports of ty direct targeting of civilians and specific groups as well as ethnic and sexual violence are continuing and it's deeply disturbing. And we have thought, as you would have seen today, we issued a statement on Sudan um, at the back end of last year in November when we held a conference on preventing sexual violence in conflict in London. I also announced our intention to launch a new international alliance and I'm delighted that's now of over 21 members. And most recently, in recent months, we've seen Spain and most notably France. France also joined the alliance. And we have other members, um, including the likes of Jordan and the Emirates. And I think it shows the broad level of commitment on this important issue. The UK is also really committed to ensuring accountability for the crime of conflict related sexual violence, and importantly, to support survivors at every step. Just in terms of specific actions, because that's a question we've asked, since the conference last year, we have now sanctioned 13, one, three individuals, including for the rape of civilians in the DRC, in Syria, in South Sudan, in Myanmar, and in the Central African Republic. And we've also pledged a further 12 and a half million pounds of funding to directly support survivors, and also help countries who are rebu rebuilding in terms of domestic mechanism on accountability and justice. And as many of you know, we're also working on an innovative solution with the International Criminal Court to provide testimony support through creating a virtual reality sense of the courtroom, but really bringing the survivors' voices to the front whilst protecting the survivors' identity and their well-being. That's why we've invited uh, both uh, Noor and Nadine to join us at this council session, because whilst we as ministers, as representatives of our different countries, have strong views on particular conflicts, wars that are ensuing. Most importantly, the United Kingdom committed right at the start of this project to put survivors and survivor voices at the heart of everything we do. And certainly from our perspective in praising Ambassador Woodward and their team here in London who do a sterling job on keeping this at the forefront of the UN agenda and of course the important role of SRSG Patton over a number of years. Indeed, I took up my mandate as a minister and special representative more or less as she took up her mandate, that's important that we continue to provide a core and pivotal platform to the survivors. So without further ado, and in recognizing some of the work that's been done, one final point I should actually state, you, many of you will recall that last year at the Security Council, we launched with, again, another amazing advocate and survivor herself, Nadia Murad, the Murad Code on ensuring survivors' testimonies are protected. And I've often said that we should be action-orientated. And this year, 
working with the McQuaigie Foundation. I'm delighted we're, we've launched the legal guidebook, which is for states to utilize directly to help them through shared experiences of how they can strengthen their own structures and systems. Without further ado, if I may, I'm going to hand over to both uh, Noor and Nadine. If I may, and I've checked this with both of them, um, as you know, particularly in, in the case of Nadine, but also in the advocacy that Noor does for survivors, there are many sensitive issues right at the heart and experiences. And I know all of you, and all of you will ask questions which I know will be appropriate and sensitive because ultimately in protecting survivors and ensuring survivors' voices are heard, we need to also ensure that when we provide such important platforms that their experiences and insights are also protected. And with that, if I may invite Noor first of all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Noor Sissa and I represent the Women's League of Beaumont a civil society coalition of 12 organizations representing women's from across Myanmar. Today, I brief the UN Security Council on the use of conflict-related sexual violence against women, especially women's human rights defendants in Myanmar. For decades, the military junta has used sexual violence to attack civilians' population with no accountability. And since the military coup in February 2021, conflict has escalated across the country. Given the domestic options for justice are impossible, I urge the Security Council to refer the situation in Myanmar to International Criminal Court for war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity, including for widespread and systematic acts the rape and sexual violence against women and girls. I also call for the Security Council to impose an embargo on the arms, ammunition, and aviation fuel, and to enact targeted sections against the military and to reject any effort by the military junta to hold sham election to legitimate its rules. Finally, I call on the international community as part of its commitment to the Women, Peace, and Security Agenda to ensure that accountability for conflict-related sexual violence, women's rights, and women participation are central, not only to its decision on Myanmar, but also other conflicts such as Sudan, Afghanistan, Yemen, Syria, and Libya. Thank you. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Now I invite Nadine. Nadine has worked with me personally as the minister and as a special representative since 2019 when together with Colabasia, we appointed them not just in a symbolic way, but I hope she'll reflect, she will speak for herself, I'm sure. But we said we want to put survivors at the heart of our policy making. She's worked very closely with me on the development of our three-year strategy, the delivery of the international conference, and most recently also led together with the other survivor champion, Kolbasia, a survivor's retreat. And I'm sure she'll have some views to share in that respect. But she's an incredible advocate in every sense. And it's been a huge honor to welcome her here to New York, as I'm sure all of you will as well. Nadine. Thank you very much, Minister Lodame. I think today was a sign of what it means to have a survivor-centered approach in a meaningful way. And I've come here as a survivor champion to bring the messages of many survivors uh, who have asked me to convey the message about what it means to have a conversation in a global way to bring state to do what is right for survivor. And when we are talking about preventing sexual violence, and responding to sexual violence, I think it's important that national states who are impacted by sexual violence are making more effort. And I wanted to highlight the challenges the survivors have, and I think it's also important that we understand that just because the war has stopped doesn't mean that survivors are no longer living in conflict. And for many of us, the war doesn't stop when the bullet has stopped, because survivors do through a lot of issues, including stigma, and 
the rejection from the community and also having to deal with the injury that they have gone through because of sexual violence. I think it's important that we're keeping this conversation going on at the global level because without a global conversation, we cannot address the issue properly. So Sarah, we are very grateful that the international community is gathering and really allowing the space for a survival-centered approach and allowing myself to be here and to speak on behalf of so many others who are part of a um, uh, survival advisory group that is working very closely with the minister. And we are very grateful for the UK government in understanding the survival-centered approach not only working the talk, but also putting into practice what it means to work and engage with survivors. I really hope for more opportunity, for more survivors to engage, and more survivors to be able to brief the international community about what it's going to take to bring the conversation forward, first of all, to prevent, but also to respond in uh, conflict-related sexual violence minors. Thank you. Thank you. Well, really over to you um, for any questions, please. We'll, we'll check. Okay. Yes, go. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much. Uh, Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. Every year we see the number of cases of conflict-related sexual violence going up, more conflicts, and we see governments and armed groups doing virtually nothing to stop it. So I wanted to ask you all whether there is anything that could be done because we do uh, give publication, television coverage to um, what these figures show, but then it appears that nobody is listening. Okay. Why don't you both answer, then I'll come in. Do you want to go first? I think it's a very good question, and I think in my remarks today, I try to highlight the fact that when you live in a country that is affected by sexual violence quite often, because people are so impacted and so traumatized, they can avoid the conversation about talking about what is happening and how people are impacted. And I think that for me, the next, for, the next point forward is really to do more work locally, more responses, and to have this conversation and break the barriers to, with survival and everybody else that is inclusive to address uh, the issue and also talk about how people are impacted. Because what has happened is sometimes the leaders have decided to watch and do nothing. But until they can comfort the devil or the demon, like they said in English, then we can be a big step in really moving in the right direction and really allowing survivors to be part of the conversation and discuss what those steps can be. Uh, if I may add a little bit uh, the context of Myanmar, um, uh, as I mentioned in the uh, briefing, so domestic option for Justin it's impossible. And that this also uh, international responsibility and accountability. They had to adopt the T25, AT20 to address each government to address and as an international community also has responsible to accountable and uh, responsible and accountable to or it as well. So that's why it, uh, we call as Myanmar because we had over seven decades conflict and civil war, and the conflict-related sexual violence has increased and increased. So it's also committed the crimes and uh, committed the international law. So that's why we call international to uh, have more commitment and effective action to take just in accountability. Thank you. Thank you. The only thing I'd really add is that from a government perspective or deed, communities that we need to take a structured approach. The issue of justice and accountability is very important, but often, as we've seen from the Balkans conflict, there are still uh, cases being brought today, and we're still in sort of triple-digit numbers in terms of the survivors who have got any sense of justice. So in that respect, what I can say is we've worked, I think it was notable last year when we 
announce the Murad Code? What does that do? It addresses a problem of victims and survivors of conflict-related sexual violence, i.e. their testimonies were sometimes had holes blown into it because they weren't held in the right way, the right questions weren't asked, and then they weren't protected to allow for a successful prosecution to take place, number one. Secondly, I mean, with the handbook, we've taken certain steps as state to see how we can share breast practice in helping local accountability. So when you look at the current Russia's illegal war on Ukraine, here you have within Ukraine, of course, the country's own government has not collapsed. We're being stood by them very strongly. But we also need to ensure that the accountability and justice mechanisms are supported not tomorrow, but today. And that's why we're working very closely with the uh, Prosecutor General's Office in Ukraine. We're working with the ICC to ensure the learnings of conflicts past are really applied to conflicts present, to ensure whilst we work on accountability and justice for those of past crimes, we also look at what's happening around the world today. And I think the launch of the International Alliance in ensuring this stays at the forefront. Thank you for the work you do in writing about these issues because it does matter. But ultimately, we've got to strike people's consciences that this is abhorrent. I use the example because I saw it, I felt it, it stays with me, of a young girl of four who had been raped in the DRC. And she sees men as someone who does that, with the exception of her father. That's the challenge we face in various places of the world. And that's why we've all got to stand up states, journalists, communities, civil society organizations, to ensure that survivors and their advocacy is not just protected, but strengthened. Please. Lord Ahmed, uh, Pramila Patton said in the Council, and I think you echoed it in your remarks, that the singular focus of this Council must be to bridge the gap between resolutions and realities, between our highest aspirations and operations on the ground. The problem, I think, in many conflict zones is that the chain of command is very confusing. If you look at what's happening in Sudan, the, the inability to implement ceasefires was because the chain of command did not wasn't very clear. I think that's echoed in places like the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Uh, Martin Griffiths, for example, talked about 125,000 cases of sexual violence expected in Eastern DRC by the end of this year alone, and that would be an undercount. So, you know, how do you close these gaps? I mean, sanctions, for example, is not justice, right? Well, sanctions is one measure, it's one tool. And is it important? Yes, because it sends a very specific signal that governments and states should not just sit back and do nothing. And when I mentioned the 13, it sounds a small number, and it is. But the fact that we've done this, we now have the structures, the systems within governments to take direct again, it sends a very strong signal that actually these crimes will be held, or you will be held accountable for it. Um, so I think there is some work being done. I think what Pramila alluded to also was the importance, yes, that We've had many statements in there. We, we've been looking at this for a very long time. I think Nadine made the point in her contribution that very small number is still being reported. And we've really got to get to the core. What is a survivor's need right at the start? They've been through the worst, worst kind of violation, unspeakable kind of violation against them, is to ensure that immediate support is there. And I think we've got better at that in recognizing that trauma support um, as you would do for any victim of sexual violence domestically, needs to be provided to those in the field when we look at conflict zones. Secondly, how do we do start building structured support when it comes to them sharing their experience when they're ready? Sometimes it can take a long time that we have the structures and mechanisms ready to support them. I think we have made some move in the right direction there. But ultimately, the whole issue of justice and accountability was the key to unlocking it. It's still taking far too long. That's why, as I said, I think we're building on some of the experiences. Sudan, you used as an example. There, every conflict is different. Sudan is with two generals who have a sheer intent that one believes the other can defeat themselves. And what needs to happen there is, of course, there needs to be a stop stop in the actual conflict itself. We need to ensure whichever states, whichever parties, as part of this global family that is the UN, who has the greatest equity on the ground, that we leverage that fully. It's not always the P5 members. It's not always, um, it may be next door neighbors. It may be regional actors. So we need to get behind that to ensure that the steps and the structure can be put in place to stop the conflict first and foremost. Then we can start looking at these specific issues. Let's not forget what happened in Tigray recently as well. These cannot go and just be hidden conflicts of the past. Accountability and justice, yes, takes a long time, but there's some structured movement we're making in that respect. I don't know if either of you want to 
add anything? Naji? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I can. I'll, I'll be brief. I, I think impunity, you know, is a reason why many survivors don't come forward to um, to report. I mean, the only way you can encourage or motivate people to report is seeing example of other, you know, perpetrator being um, either accountable of what they've done. I know that we have a long way in reaching justice, but I think we're going somewhere, and we can only hope that. Uh, most, more perpetrators will be held into accountable. And from a survivor perspective, I think it's important that we deliver the justice that is survivor-centered. And sometimes what a survivor wants is not to see a perpetrator going to court necessarily. It's about receiving reparation and the suffering that they have endured has been addressed. I think we have to ensure that we have a balance and achieving not only one, but um, uh, the two justice in terms of survivor. Thank you. Thank you. And just as a final point, we've got items like the Global Survivors Fund, which Dr. McQuaggy leads on. Again, phenomenal work in both providing that initial support. So we need to get behind the institution. So in the DRC, I don't know if any of you have, but if you get an opportunity, when you visit the Pansy Hospital, here is a man who could earn millions anywhere across the world. And it is his conviction which puts him in the front line, often at great cost to him. But at the same time, that's why we're really honored and delighted that we built on his advocacy in some of the tools we're providing. Thank you once again. And um, if I may, on your behalf, also acknowledge our courageous contributors today. And we've been really proud as the UK to host them today. Thank you so much. Thank you.